Hello, hello, everybody. How's it going? As you come in, please say hello. Say hi to your neighbor if you wish. <clears throat> say hi to me. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to wait just a, a moment or two like, like I usually do for um, everybody to come in. Today I've got a little bit of a special treat for you. I'll be doing um, that chemistry demonstration that talked about last time. I've got a second camera set up so we should have a, a pretty good view of what's happening. Um, and all this with my aquarium and a simple pH testing kit to elaborate on what we're learning today. So I'm excited about that and you guys will have um, hopefully a little more engaging, interesting lecture today. All right, so last time we were talking about um, reactions in reactors and we defined some mass balances and we were taking a look at um, really what, how to understand the math in a system. So these were our slides from last time. I think I, I left off perhaps with one last bit of a slide to cover. So I'm gonna pick up there um, just now and then we're gonna launch into uh, kind of refresher on chemistry. <clears throat> All right, so last time we were talking about essentially mass balances. We solved this practice problem. We were taking a look at what concentration of waste was going to be in this lake given that it was just naturally degrading and we had a wastewater incoming and the stream had some pollution in it and then we wanted to find what happens as it leaves. So I wanted to take a quick note and tell you that you're able to find or solve for k in some cases and sometimes this is going to be um, a requirement in the problem. So we, we took a look at the different forms where we, where we take uh, you know, some accumulation rate, some mass balance that has accumulation equals what's going in minus what's going out plus whatever reaction terms we had. So we can find K from within the reaction terms and solve for it. Now, there's some relatively simple cases. If we were to plot a first order decay reaction, remember our general equation looks kind of like this, right? Some reaction, the change in concentration over time, for a decay reaction, that's a negative, and for a first order, N here is one. And so, what we said in a batch system, and really whenever we're doing kinetics, batch is very, very much what we wanna do because it's simple and straightforward. If we have empirical data, we have measurements of some, some concentration of something degrading over time, and it looks something like that. This would be pretty typical for a first order decay reaction. Now you could use Excel and find a, an exponential fit for that curve. It would not be a good idea to use the linear fit, right? Because it would look something strange, it wouldn't really fit it very well. Um, but what we want to do is instead of, instead of have that curve, we can go into Excel and do what we call linearization of the data and simply what we're looking at here is the, the concentration, and we know that's equal to, for the, the first order kinetics, first order decay in a batch case, first order decay in a batch reactor, that's gonna look like this, C equals C naught times E to the minus KT. So it makes sense that as a function of time, our concentration is going to be exponential, right? We, we covered that previously. Um, I'm reminding you now that this is what it looks like. You've seen this before. And it makes sense that we see this exponential. And actually in class last time we, we talked about, or actually on the way to deriving this, 
we had a case where we said the natural log of C, and if we, if we move this over here, it's the natural log of C over C naught, equals E to the minus KT, oh, excuse me, uh, just minus KT. So in this way, we can linearize it. So if instead of writing, um, writing just concentration, if instead we do the natural log of the concentration, or even better, natural log of the concentration divided by the initial concentration, and plot that instead, it becomes linear. And so that's what I mean by linearizing the data. And I think I've got this next slide here showing if we did just that, then we plot it. Um, these slides, I, th I think both sets of slides are, and I'll check with you in a moment when I transition from this, uh, this section to the next. I think I posted this set where I, I um, filled it in. This is just at the very tail end of last time's um, lecture. And I think I have the updated version up there, and I think I also have the chemistry overview but I, I will check that before I move into that part. Um, okay, so if we linearize it and plot it that way, then we have a data set that's gonna look more like this, where we have a linear line that we can, we can work with. Um, with this, it becomes very easy to um, find the slope and use that slope. This gives us a form of y equals mx plus b, where y here is the natural log of c over c naught, and that's equal to mx plus b, and our m is the slope. This is where we get k. There's another another way to look at this is if you're given half-life. You've probably heard of half-life, half-life of some radioactive material. The half-life, when we're talking about half-life in particular, um, that is a per time basis. We're saying we have to the amount of stuff in 12 hours. So if the half-life is 12 hours, then we say one half is equal to the amount that's remaining divided by the, what we started with, that's literally the definition of half-life. You could do mass, but here I'm doing concentration. Um, and we know that takes 12 hours to get there. So if we're trying to find k, we're trying to solve for k, then what we can do is set up our half-life equation to say this is equal to e to the minus k times 12 hours. And then we solve for k, to do that, we take the natural log of both sides, natural log of one half equals minus k times 12 hours. And then it becomes very easy to solve for k. And you see here this works because natural log of one half is unitless and you divide by hours and then k is equal to something in hours to the minus one. So I wanted to show you this because you have the information to solve for k um, but you may not have recognized that. <clears throat> so we could, we could do this in Excel, um, and I think I will go through that with you at some point when we talk about disinfection, um, kind of bring, bring this topic up again and remind you that we can take that data, take that natural log of, you know, at, at this point it's natural log of the concentration here divided by what we started with. Um, and here divided by what we started with. Um, so we can plot it. It's very simple in Excel to just do it as a couple of rows with time on our X, and then we can plot it and uh, it works out nicely. So I wanted to give you that quick review of um, the process so that you could be a little more familiar with how to solve for K if you are not given K, but you're given some information about K. And we'll probably have a, a problem on our homework where your your first homework that's given something like that. Okay, so that's it for the first set of slides. I'm going to load up Moodle now, um, 
and double check that. The next set of slides are on. So this here is the first, um, first page of the next set of slides. The chemistry overview and the intro to drinking water. So let me just bring up Moodle and we will check together here. So here's our page, <clears throat> and I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i come back to your questions in just a moment. So under section two, I did not post it, I apologize. So I'll post it right now. Um, this was from last semester, so I'm gonna go ahead and let's just do this. You get to see the back end. Um, I'm going to need to close this for a moment so that I can upload it. Okay, so if you want to follow along with the, the chemistry slides, these are now up. Um, let me visible. Okay, and I'll put the link to the today's lecture here as well. Okay, so those slides are up. I uh, apologize I didn't do that before, but there they are. All right, and I need to open them here. So let me come back and answer your questions real quick. Um, okay, so in order to find K, you need to be given the half-life. Um, you, The half-life is one example. I could give you the quarter-life. Um, yeah, th and thank you, thank you, Reese, for helping to answer that. Um, it doesn't have to be half-life. It could be some other information. I could give you a data set, and then you'd need Excel, um, perhaps. But what I wanted to show you is that relationship between our equations. Now for a zero order, you can probably do it more intuitively just um, in your mind, but you know, if we recall this as C equals C naught minus KT for a zero order decay. And so that would look different than the half-life, but you could still, you could say, okay, I ended with one and I started with two minus KT over some amount of hours and do the, you know, K times, let's say 12 hours. And essentially that's giving you your half-life as well. Um, so depending on what type of equation it is, what type of a uh, reaction it is, there's, there's different things you can do. And it, 12 hours is just an example. Um, there's, there's other things we could do. You know, if it was a zero order decay and we were to plot it, with time and C, this is linear already, so we don't need to linearize it, right? We can just draw a line of best fit and then get the slope from that. So either we're using Excel or we're giving, given some information about, about the C versus C naught with some information about time, then you can solve for K. So that's, that's kind of a, to add just a little bit to that um, topic. Okay, moving on to chemistry, what we're trying to focus on today. For chemistry, um, we already talked a little bit about the atomic mass units and molecular weights, things like that. So I just wanna quickly go through a couple examples, make sure you're familiar with going and looking at the periodic table and finding the right information you need. So oxygen, for example, is O, and the atomic weight is listed beneath the number. So, and this usually has some fraction associated with it because it's averaging over um, different isotopes. Every atom has a unique number of protons. 
that's this number here. And then some variability in neutrons to equal this number. Protons equal one AMU and so do neutrons. So in nature, oxygen has you know, typically eight protons and usually eight neutrons. Sometimes it has seven, maybe occasionally it has nine. That's why you just have this tiny fraction of them are, are less heavy than eight plus eight. You don't really need to know all that. I'm just, you know, probably some of you remember that. I'm just letting you know. We're not gonna deal with isotopes. So what, the main point here is this is the number you need for your atomic um, mass. This also corresponds to, you know, if we take one mole of oxygens, then we convert this from 16 atomic mass units to 16 grams, okay? And that's how we go from the atomic mass to grams. So for every mole of oxygen, there are 16 grams there. Okay, while I'm at the at it here, I want to remind you of how to work with chemical equations, some very basic stuff here, um, and also remind you what, what we mean when we talk about oxygen. We're not going to deal with atomic oxygen very often, but I wanted to make sure you know that the subscript here is the number of those atoms in the molecule. So for atomic oxygen, it's not a molecule, it's just the atom, and of course that weighs 16 grams per mole. If we're talking about molecular oxygen, that's the stuff that you and I are breathing right now. And that is O2. With a two here, that means it's essentially an oxygen bonded to another oxygen. And then there's some stuff about their extra electrons. Don't worry about that. But essentially this is molecular oxygen um, and it's floating around. That's what we're breathing and, and all that stuff. Okay, don't wanna draw any attention to what you don't need to know here. So that's oxygen as molecular oxygen. So if, if we're talking about oxygen generically, you can assume we're talking about molecular oxygen. What I mean is if I give you a problem and ask you how much oxygen is required for bacteria to consume all this waste. You can assume we're talking about O2 oxygen. Now there's a third form of oxygen and that's called ozone. You've heard of that, I'm sure. This is O3. So in this case, it's O, O, and they're kind of sharing, there's some bond sharing going on there and it's uh, three oxygens in one molecule, and that's ozone. Of course, that will weigh 48 grams per mole, um, as opposed to 32 from molecular oxygen or 16 from atomic. So hopefully this is clear. Hopefully this is just boring review here. We, we call this one here, and the way to count the molecular weight would just be adding the number of atoms, their atomic weight, and then we can convert that to grams if we're talking about moles of these um, atoms or molecules. Okay, so then we can move on to look at atoms and molecules with a charge. And I want you to be familiar, familiar with these um, and a f maybe a few extra on your first homework. And I will, I will remind you with an email when I post the homework, but I'm gonna have one page the first page of the homework is going to be review. It's going to be optional. You don't have to do it, but one thing I have you do is write up these molecular polyatomic ions. So ju that just means that there's, there are molecules that are ions. So we have ions like hydrogen. This is where we get acid. This is acidity, essentially. And that's also how we calculate pH, which we'll get into in a minute. We have sodium, Na+, calcium, and this should be a calcium 2+, plus. I'll go and fix that real quick. So the, the two should have been superscripted, not subscripted, that's all I'm fixing here. Okay, so Ca2+, plus. And because this was, uh, was not meaning that this is going to be a 
a molecule, Ca with um, a 2 subscripted, that would mean it's a molecule and that did not exist. So this needs to be superscripted like I changed it. So Ca2+, plus, that's calcium ions, chloride ions, bromide ions, iodide. We could go through all sorts. There's, you know, um, manganese, 2+, plus, and you know, all sorts of stuff that we can, we can take a look at. Um, then we have these molecular ions. So you may remember from general chemistry back in the day, polyatomic ions. It's just a fancy word for things like phosphate, PO4 with a three minus, sulfate, SO4 with a two minus, carbonate, CO3 two minus, um, and even water can participate in, in one of these equilibrium reactions that we're gonna discuss. So what you notice here is I have these three species. Um, to be an ion, they have to have a charge. So water is not an ion. Um, but what I was going to show you here is we can add a hydrogen to some of these. So adding a hydrogen to phosphate takes that positive charge and adds it to the molecule. And so now it becomes two minus instead of three minus. We could add two or even three and ultimately reduce that to, um, we'll leave this here. We'll reduce that to no charge at all. And so what I'm showing you here is a reaction where we can add or subtract this hydrogen um, and it slightly changes the form of the ion and it changes the charge. And this, since it has to do with the hydrogen here, this is going to be affected by pH. How much hydrogen do we have will dictate how much is in one form or the other. This happens with sulfate. This happens with carbonate, carbonic acid. Um, this is phosphoric acid. And water can do it too with, uh, you can take H2O and subtract an H and you get OH minus. And on the other hand, you're, you're uh, adding this H plus. And we'll, we'll look at this in just a moment, but we can write it this way. There are other polyatomic ions. Not all of them go through this acid-base chemistry. For example, nitrate doesn't typically do that. Nitrate is NO3 minus. Nitrite is NO2 minus. OCL minus is hypochlorite. So that's our, our bleach. This one does go through the, the proton, protonation. We'll discuss that more. Um, So what I would like for you to do is just simply be somewhat familiar with these. And it'd probably be a good idea to commit to memory some of the charges. On an exam, I'm gonna do my best to give you all this information um, so that you don't have to worry too much about uh, forgetting what charge nitrite has. Um, but I think for your own understanding, it would be good to be familiar with these basic ones. So that's, that's why the first page of the homework um, has a chart with this. It's up to you to do it. I'm not gonna grade it one way or the other. Okay, so let's move on and solve a, a essentially a mass balance or a numbers balance on a chemical reaction. This is what we call stoichiometry, determining the number relationship of molecules that are reacting and then making sure that we have an atom balance so we're not creating or subtracting atoms out of nothing so this is again thinking back to the analogy of egging a car we want to make sure that we have the right amount of eggs per car um, because there's some defined ratio that's not you know obviously the best um, example but the the concern of having the number instead of the mass is what matters. That's what I'm drawing the attention to. Okay, so in terms of chemical reactions, even though sometimes we might simplify it and talk about adding some mass of chlorine into a swimming pool, 
all of the reactions themselves are on a number basis. So we're always going to have to deal with chemistry on a number concentration basis. So this is meaning we're dealing with moles per liter, or we can write that as capital M for shortcut for moles per liter. That means we're dealing with the bracketed concentration of some, some dissolved concentration C. Okay, an example, um, and this is not water, this would be a gas phase example, but the same principle applies. An example would be methane combustion. So let's take a look at how to balance the methane combustion. Now maybe you're familiar, maybe you want to go ahead and try this on your own. Feel free to pause and do so. <clears throat> but to balance this equation, what I would do is say, we don't know how many we're combusting, we don't know how much oxygen per methane we're combusting, or how much CO2, or how much water. And what we're going to do is simplify this, um, you know, we could do, we could start off with 100 here, 100 molecules of methane. So the, the number that comes before the molecule, this is defining how many molecules are there. Um, the number subscripted afterwards is, says how many atoms of hydrogen here are in that molecule. So anytime we put a number on the outside, on the left, this is saying how many molecules. So even if we started with 100, we're ultimately interested in the ratio, how many oxygen molecules per methane molecule. So we're gonna end up dividing by the lowest common denominator and get simple answers. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start with a guess at one. So let's say one, and I'm using the methane first because that has a carbon and if I look through the other places you know there's three oxygens you know three different places have oxygen only two places have the carbon only two places have the hydrogen so you can start with what you like but typically if we're doing like a combustion sort of thing I find it's good to start with the carbon so the only other carbon on the other side is here so that has to be one if our methane is one so then I'll go ahead and balance the hydrogens because again, that's the next simplest one. We'll balance the oxygens last based on what, what's happened otherwise. So we have four hydrogens times one molecule. So that's four hydrogens total on the left side. We need four on the right side. Each molecule of water that is formed has two. So simply we need two molecules of water. So one methane, it's four hydrogens, two waters, that's four hydrogens. So the, we can take a look at it as carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen balance. One and one, four and four. And now for oxygen, we see that so far what we have written is two times one is two, plus two times one is two. So it's four total on the left. Now we need we must have four on, excuse me, that was the right. Now we must have four on the left. And so then we force this part to become four. So two times two is four. And everything checks out, everything's balanced. And you can take this same process and do it to all sorts of other equations. So just wanted to, to quickly remind you of that process, a good strategy for it and Really, we're, we're again coming back to a simple principle of, you know, we're not creating or destroying any matter here. We're not doing any nuclear physics that's converting, you know, hydrogens to helium or anything weird like that. Okay, so if there's any questions there, um, obviously feel free to ask. But hopefully that's review, hopefully that's um, helpful. So I would encourage you to work this example on your own. I'll walk you through it in just a moment. Uh, but essentially, this is an example from the book, page 50. Uh, the mass of CO2 produced, so the question is asking, what is the mass of CO2 produced if 100 grams of butane is fully oxidized? So what I've done here is I've given you the, the periodic table snippet. So we have the oxygen, hydrogen over here, is just essentially one 
You can just assume that's one. It's basically one proton. So we have oxygen, we have hydrogen, and we have carbon. Okay, so essentially what I'm having you do here is practice using this to understand the mass. So we have mass here. to moles because we have to translate through a chemical reaction back to mass. So we have mass of CO2 produced if some mass of butane is fully oxidized. Okay, so give that some thought. Pause if you want to take some time to do it on your own and then uh, come back. Just press play to join us uh, when you're ready. Okay, so I'm gonna take the same pro approach here. We'll take one butane that gives four carbons, so I'm gonna need four CO2s here. From there, I'm gonna go ahead and balance the hydrogens. We've got 10 on the left, that means we need 10 on the right. We'll do that by five times H2, so that's 10 on the right. Now we have oxygens, and we have eight here for CO2, plus five here, that's 13, so five plus eight is 13. So over on this side, we're gonna have not a whole number. So 13 divided by two is the number because then we multiply by the two and then we have 13 on the left um, and 13 on the right. So you could write it this way or you could say you don't like that on the denominator and so you do two CH4H10 plus 13 O2 goes to eight CO2 and 10 H2O. Um, doesn't matter to me which way you do it. it. I'm gonna leave this up to your preference, but you see here, the important part is the ratio, right? We, we're, at the end of the day, we're looking at CO2 per butane, okay? So one thing we can write immediately is the ratio of CO2, so the moles CO2, per mole butane burned is equal to four CO2 divided by one butane. Okay, so then we have that ratio there. Yes, and I'll be, I'm happy to explain where the 13 divided by 2 comes from. So when I was solving it in the first place, I said we had one carbon. So we had one carbon here, or excuse me, one molecule here, just arbitrary, starting with one. That gave us four carbons on the left. On the right, I went ahead and had to put the four here because that means we have four total carbons on the right side. Then I moved on to getting the hydrogens in place. So because I put one over here, we had 10 hydrogens on the left side, and I had to put five here to get 10 hydrogens on the right. So at that point we had, and I'll go ahead and uh, do the, the balance here. So carbons, we had four goes to four. Hydrogens, we had um, 10 goes to 10, and then for the oxygens, I had to balance it, and I noticed on the right side, since I already had the four and the five filled in, that gave us eight here, eight oxygens here on the, on, from the CO2, and five oxygens from the uh, water. So that was 13 on this side. So on the left side then, I needed to get 13 oxygens total, and so, Really, I just had to have 13, but I needed to divide it by two because oxygen had two in it. So that's why I just wrote it as um, 13 divided by two times two, these two canceled and I'm left with a 13. And ultimately, yeah, it, it, it comes back to kind of the same, the same ratio there. And so the other way to write it is the, right here. Okay, 
So given that, um, now that we have the stoichiometry in place, and I, I would encourage you whenever you have a problem like this, go ahead and write this up. Check to see if you have the ratio, make sure you establish the ratio, and write out the units. These units are gonna help you, um, and you'll see in just a moment um, how helpful it'll be. So now we're, we're ready to start solving the problem. Um, there's probably one other piece of information we need since we're dealing with mass of two molecules. I would say let's go ahead and calculate the molecular weight for both. So molecular weight for CO2 and the molecular weight for butane. I'm just going to abbreviate it. And so for CO2, that would be 12. I'm just going to leave it at 12. Going to do this kind of... Um, you're welcome to use the decimal places, but generally, unless it's like, um, you know, chlorine is 35.45, you should definitely include um, some of those decimal places. But for something like oxygen, it's so close to 16. I'm just going to simplify and say it's 16. So CO2, this is 12 plus 32. This is 44. And we're going to write that as grams per mole. Butane here is 12 times 4. Which is 48 plus 10. So that's 58. Grams per mole. Because that's, again, that's 4 of the carbons. 4 times 12 is 48. Plus 10 hydrogens. Hydrogen is 1 gives us 58 grams per mole. Okay, now we've got everything in place and we'll solve. <clears throat> so we have 100 grams of butane. And we want to convert this to moles because we want to go from, um, from mass to moles, make that molar ratio comparison, and then convert back to mass. That's going to be almost all of these problems if we're given mass, then we need to go to moles. We compare, and then we convert back to mass. This is going to be a common, a common method here um, of solving equations uh, and solving our, chemi our problems in chemistry, um, following that that routine or that uh, rhythm there. So we've got 100 grams of butane. We're going to say, okay, to convert that to moles, we can't multiply because then we'd have grams squared. So we need to divide that by 58 grams per mole of butane. So this is going to give us um, some number. Grab a calculator. We've got 100 divided by 58, 1.72. This will be 1.72 moles butane because the uh, grams cancel and the mole comes to the top. From here, we take this and say, okay, 1.72 moles butane yields some amount of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, right? So we can take this and multiply the moles butane times the ratio we found earlier to convert it from moles butane to moles um, of CO2. So now we're going to take this and multiply it by the four moles CO2. And here's why I was telling you to keep the units. Time divided by one moles butane. And now we see that the bottom here cancels um, with these units and we're left with 1.72 times 4. So we'll take this number that we calculated and just go ahead and straight multiply it and we get 6.90 is going to be, you know, because that 9 will round up and so we'll say 6.90 moles CO2. So we just went from mass to moles. That was this step. Then we went moles 
and we did the comparison. So now we've got it in moles CO2, and now we're about to go moles to mass. Okay, that's uh, the scheme of things right here. So now we take this 6.90 mole CO2 and multiply it by the molecular weight of CO2 because that will get rid of the moles. This will be multiplied by 44 grams of CO2 per mole of CO2. And that'll give us our final answer. So we can just take this one and multiply by 44. And our final answer here is 303.4. moles, uh, excuse me, grams of CO2. All right. So if anybody has questions, obviously feel free. Um, even if you paused and have a question later, I'm happy to come back to this. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I tried to be as explicit and elaborate with the calculations as I could. But at the end of the day, this is pretty straightforward, and I expect you to be able to do this with uh, similar problems, different, different chemical equations. I expect you to be able to do that. And on exams, I will make sure that either I help you out with the, um, the reaction if it's unfamiliar or um, make it fairly simple. So the, the chemical equations, usually I will give it to you. Um, if it's like a combustion problem here, it, yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what is being reacted. You may have to solve the stoichiometry, right? So you may have to do that, or maybe something very simple like I tell you sodium chloride dissolves. I might do that and expect you to know that's going to dissolve and become sodium and chloride. Um, generally, I'm... I'm going to do my best, especially on exams, to not give you anything more complicated, but there are a few key things like this sodium chloride dissolving. I do expect you to know that. Um, you know, we, we don't have any, you know, th this doesn't break apart any other way. It's just sodium and chloride. Um, usually I'll even tell you that it, that it is like this. So it's going to be relatively straightforward, but just Make sure that you're comfortable with um, these basic chemistry uh, concepts so that if I were to tell you something completely dissolves um, or deionizes or yeah, dissociates, some key words like that, um, you should be able to uh, see, see what that means. And again, the homework should prepare you with some of this language and uh, the scope of what you're looking at. Okay, so that was just more space to solve it, but we did that. Okay, so the combustion reaction that we just looked at is an example of a irreversible reaction. That's like, you know, burning something. You can't go from having something burned to reverting it back to what it was before, at least not directly. Um, you can't cook your steak and then put it in the refrigerator to uncook it, right? That's an irreversible reaction. The chemistry is happening in such a way where it's never coming back. Combustion is a good example of that, but there's some equilibrium reactions, which are what we call reversible, that can go both ways that we need to know about. The stoichiometry still applies, right? So if we look at this reversible reaction here, we have hypochlorous acid, this is bleach. We're going to look at this quite a lot, especially when we get to disinfection, and I'm prepping you now so that um, when we get back to it, it'll be just a reminder. We have one here, there's an H, an O, a C, and a Cl. So over on the other side, we have one, one Cl, one O, and 1H. Okay, so the these the stoichiometry certainly applies to our 
equilibrium reactions just as much as it would to a combustion or a, rever uh, a reversible reaction, irreversible reaction, excuse me. Now this one, bleach, goes through forward and backward reactions. And so the forward reaction is HOCl dissociates into H plus and OCl minus. And we would call this maybe a partial dissociation because at the same time, these two react together to go the other way. And we see this a lot when it's just adding or subtracting a proton, a H plus. It's fairly common in those cases and we call these, you know, in a lot of senses, these are acid-base reactions where we have that proton adding or subtracting off of an, a molecule. <clears throat> we reach an equilibrium when the rates at which these are going back and forth are equal. Usually this happens very quickly, so we're not going to be dealing with reaching it, you know, how long does it take to reach the equilibrium. Um, what, but the equilibrium constants are going to tell us how much is in one form or the other given the pH or given some other conditions. Um, most of the stuff we're going to deal with is pH dependent. Um, these reactions typically are also temperature dependent because the equilibrium constant, how fast these reactions depend on the temperature. We're not going to deal with that. I'm just going to keep it simple and just have um, one equilibrium constant and I'll give you that or maybe we'll maybe we'll solve for it, but usually I'm just going to give that to you. <coughs> and then um, we'll go from there. Okay, so I want to give you a quick uh, illustration here. There's a, a good YouTube video on describing how it works with some amount of the product versus reactant. So if we, if we think about water, for example, goes through this equilibrium reaction with H plus and OH minus. Most of it exists as the liquid form water. There's actually just a small fraction of it exists as the smaller components. Um, so in this case, we have a big reservoir of water and it's going back and forth with this small little, little bit of OH and H plus minus, but the, the rates at which those are going back and forth have equalized and they're, they're pretty much constant. The way we describe this occurrence, you know, and I'll show you the video in just a moment, but the way we describe how it's going back and forth in, in the equation is just like we did with the stoichiometry for a reversible. We have um, some amount, some number of moles of molecule A plus some number of moles of molecule B goes back and forth with C molecules of C and D molecules of D. So this would be like one mole of butane or, or methane, let's say, plus, you know, however many moles of oxygen. So this would be B, this would be A, this is big A, this is big B, um, whatever we're doing here, that's, you know, that's the structure of it, just like we were just saying. We define the equilibrium constant then by the products divided by the reactants. And so we have this KEQ, this equilibrium reaction, the, the constant for the, for the reaction is equal to the brackets here. So brackets meaning this is the molar concentration. because we're doing this on a number basis. We have to compare these on a number basis. We'll use molar concentration. So make sure that whenever you're solving an equilibrium reaction, you're using molar units. Uh, we have to, because that's how this is defined. It's on a molar basis, so we're comparing the number of molecules. A lot of times these are just going to be one, and it will be very simple. Uh, the other thing to, to make a note of, and I could explain this in more depth some other time, but if we have the reaction for water, for example, so if we were to look at the KEQ for water, 
This is going to be equal to the products. So the products on the right side, and the reactants are on the left. So the products over the reactants, this would be H plus to the one power, because we have one of them, times OH minus, and this is multiplied. So these guys are multiplied together. Make sure you, you're not adding, you're multiplying these things. Sometimes students make a mistake and add them, and you're clearly going to get the wrong answer if you're adding instead of multiplying. OH minus also just one. And then the concentration down here of water. Now it turns out that the concentration of water in liquid form is so high, we, we end up just in a way ignoring this by counting this as one. Again, I can, I can derive that a little better for you if you're curious, but I'm not gonna do that just today because I wanna get on to my demonstration for you. So if this goes to one, then the KEQ just becomes, for water, becomes H plus times OH minus. And we'll, we'll look at that in terms of how pH works um, in just a moment. But what I wanted to show you is this is the equation, the essentially the it's a mass balance of sorts determining how much is in which ratio. This is kind of showing the ratio, like what ratio is products versus what ratio is reactants. Okay? And the video, I hope, will help understand how this is playing out. Okay, so I'm going to play this. It's going to talk a little bit. I'm going to skip through a little bit because we don't need truly six minutes of it. Um, I'm going to probably mute my mic so that you're not listening to any feedback. Um, and I will uh, re resume my mic if I need to say something. Okay, this little demonstration kind of helps us with the idea of uh, equilibrium and reversible reactions. So what we see here, um, to start off, we have colored water, some green water here, um, that represents our reactant side of our process. And then of course we have our empty container over here that represents our um, product side of the process. So on any good reaction, when you start the process, everything's a reactant. So we all have all the water over here and nothing is a product. Um, when you have a reversible reaction, or a reaction that has to reach equilibrium, what happens is as soon as you start making product, that product also starts making reactant. So on our very first scoop, if I'm using two identical beakers, if I go in here and scoop, on the very first scoop, all of it is going to be reactant turning into product and none of the other. However, the very next time I scoop, some of my product is actually going to go back into my reactant side. Now, if I continue to scoop like this, and continue to do this, you'll notice how at first the reaction ran really fast. And at first, a lot of water was switching sides going to the product side. But then it kind of seems to slow down a little bit. And at some point, if I continue to scoop, the amount that I scoop going each direction will become the same. So if I look, I have 250. Okay, so he's. He's basically showing that now he's he's moving the same amount of water across, so his rate has essentially um, equilibria, um, become the the system has found equilibrium. Uh, the same amount of map product and reactant are moving to either side. Um, that for our case happens almost immediately, and so we're not going to worry about how long that takes to get there. Uh, but what I want you to know is the equilibrium constant is going to define what ratio between the products and reactants we have. And like he's going to change the beaker size in a moment, we're going to see if you have a, a larger beaker that's moving more product over, but this is a first order reaction. It depends on how much is in there. The beaker is only going to grab a little bit if there's not much in there. And so what we'll end up seeing is there's going to be a big difference between um, how much it is being moved based on the reactor, um, kind of the, the reaction rate. So that equilibrium constant is going to determine that ratio. Okay, so I'm going to fast forward this a little bit and then let him go again with a larger beaker and a smaller beaker.
reactant, I'm going to use the little guy for my product side. Okay, so in our very first scoop, again, it's all reactant, no product. Again, I start scooping and I get some product back to reactant. Okay, now you might think there's no way you can get equilibrium here because the big scooper will always outdo the little guy, which is kind of a common thought. But the reality is that doesn't happen. At some point, the big one actually does run out of steam here. Again, we're looking for equal rate of transfer. So if I check, okay, I'm doing 140 milliliters here, and here, again, I'm at about 140 milliliters. So if you look, these two volumes, even though they're in different size containers, again, are showing almost identical volume, which means if I pour 140 into here, and I pour 140 into here, there's no difference, okay? Okay, so hopefully that, that gives a, a better visualization of what we're talking about when we're saying, or we're looking at the products going from, you know, from the reactants to the products and back and forth. Yeah. Keep that image in your mind so that you understand that there might be more of one than the other. In the case of water, there's certainly more water than there is hydrogen and hydroxide. But nonetheless, there, there's the same amount moving back and forward. So that's what KEQ, or sometimes we'll say for water, KW, um, like that. That's what's... Um, that constant is what's determining at what point are we at that equilibrium. How much is product versus how much are reactant. So it's kind of just um, a gauge that's showing how much is in, in which form. So if we were to look at getting there as a function of time, the rate itself will eventually become equal. And that's what he was showing. At first he had the forward rate, everything was going from products from reactants to products, so the forward rate, rate was high. At first, the reverse rate was zero, so there were no products to reverse from. And eventually, once he reached equilibrium, he was moving the same amount of stuff either way. So the rates will become the same. The amounts can be different. Like you saw, um, over time, there became more water in one bucket than the other, um, but essentially, eventually they, they hold constant. So even though we might have most of our water as water um, and a tiny amount as OH minus and H plus, we still have these reactions happening. And everything that we're gonna do in the class is gonna assume that we've already reached equilibrium, okay? So we're not gonna deal with any of this beforehand, but it's maybe helpful just watch it happen um, to understand why it's reaching an equilibrium and why that equation makes sense. Okay, so here's here's where we're going with this. We have um, these equilibrium reactions and we have very often some chemical and it's going to exist in a different or slightly different state based on the pH of solution. So the pH is you know a measure of acidity. We're going to talk about it um, more in a moment and really what it means and then I'm going to give you a demonstration. We might not get to the drinking water stuff, but the chemistry will be fun um, today for you. So that we'll get to that later uh, if we need. So essentially what we see here is this carbonate. I mentioned it earlier. The part that is carbonate here, CO3, 2 minus, this is, if we look at a fraction, so the fraction of total total CO3, and really this is dissolved CO2. Um, but don't worry about that. Um, so if we look at the total amount of this carbonate stuff, whether or not we have hydrogen on it, um, the total fraction becomes one, or nearly one, when, when we have almost everything, so, when we have almost everything in the form of CO3 to minus, that happens at very high pHs um, because there's very few, few H plus around. So all the H plus is stripped off of the molecule. 
over at low pH, we have lots of H+. This will make more sense in a moment when I define pH and how that works. So down here, we have most of it has extra, extra um, H's to add. So this is going to be H2CO3 is in equilibrium with HCO3 minus plus H plus. So this is going to be the equilibrium reaction that's happening between these two. So when we have more protons, it's going to push that way. Um, if we have less protons, it's going to push that way. So if we increase the pH, we're pushing to the right. If we're decreasing it, we're pushing it to the left. So that's why we have this, this graph here. And at some point, they're equal. And this is going to be the P, the Ka, so K, excuse me, the KEQ for, um, for, the, for this reaction up here, okay? And we define that as this K is going to be equal to essentially um, 10 to the minus 6.3 or something like that, because that's going to correspond to the pH scale here. Um, I'll show you more of that in a minute. But that's, that's the location the KEQ happens um, for that one. This other reaction here would be HCO3 minus is in equilibrium with CO3 2 minus and H plus. And again, we have that equilibrium point where there's the same amount on either side. Um, they can be in equilibrium at a different location. They just have different amounts, right? They're the same amount is transferring back and forth, but we have more in one bucket than the other. So these are just the points where the buckets have the same exact amount. Okay, so what does pH mean? Well, P is a function, and sometimes we even do pKa or pKeq. Um, and so we're, we'll keep it just pretty simple with just Keq, but sometimes this operator is used in other places when it's convenient. It's essentially like a logarithm shortcut. So P, um, when we take a look at the H2O equation, we have waters in equilibrium with H plus and OH minus. The equilibrium constant for that is defined as 10 to the minus 14th. I told you last time that water as liquid form goes to one. So 10 to the minus 14th equals H plus times OH minus. You're probably familiar, but at pH seven, we call that neutral, um, meaning we have the same amount of acid as we have base. So OH minus is our, our base and H plus is our acid. So when we take pH, what we're saying is the P stands for negative log of something. Um, so the P here, we can take P of X is negative log of X. So if we take the negative log of our hydrogen concentration, that's what the H stands for, is the amount of acid. So the H plus is the H in our pH. At pH 7, we take negative log of H plus and say that that equals 7. So when we say P h equals 7, what we're saying is negative log of h plus equals 7. That's what we mean when we say pH is 7. Now that gives us lots of information, all the information in fact, to find the concentration of h plus. So from there we know we can say this means that if we, if we move this negative to the other side, that's going to say log of H plus is equal to negative seven. And to get rid of the logarithm, we take both sides, we take 10 to the power of either side, uh, both sides. So 10 to the log of H is going to be just H. So we get rid of the logarithm there. 
that, but we have to do that to both sides. And we remember we swapped that negative. So now we have H plus the concentration. And again, these are brackets. The concentration in moles per liter equals moles of H plus per liter is equal to 10 to the minus seven moles per liter. Um, and at pH seven, we also know because this is neutral, we have the same amount of acid as the same amount of base. This is equal to the moles per liter, moles of OH minus per liter. Okay, so that's pH. If we were to do pH four, um, so let me say pH equals four, that means our H plus equals 10 to the minus four moles per liter. And what you'll notice here is the reason low pH is higher acid is because we're reducing this negative exponent. So pH one means it's 10 to the minus one moles per liter. That's a lot more than pH seven, or we have 10 to the minus seven. You know, that's um, a factor of uh, a million times more concentrated. It's 10 to the six more. So we see now that, you know, if we know H plus, we can know OH minus, because this is always true that H plus times OH minus is equal to 10 to the minus 14th. And if, if you see here with the, at pH seven, we have H plus is 10 to the minus seven, and so is OH minus. So you multiply those two together, you get 10 to the minus 14th. At pH four, we would say, um, we could solve for it and say 10 to the minus four times OH minus, maybe we're solving for OH minus, is equal to 10 to the minus 14. That balance still exists. So then OH minus is going to equal 10 to the minus 14 divided by 10 to the minus four. And that's going to give us 10 to the minus 10, if you look at the, uh, the way those are going to work. So we have less OH minus at low pH. And this is kind of on a log scale. Okay, so I told you I promised some live demonstration of chemistry. So that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So I've got another camera here for you. Let me see if it's a going to work. It was working earlier, so let me try plugging it back in. I have too many devices plugged in. I might have to unplug my, um, my touchpad, just give me a moment. It'll be just a moment, I'm troubleshooting. It's a little unfortunate this was working just before I got on, of course. I'm just gonna remove that. that's not the right one so just give me a second okay it's just not recognizing it this computer is a little bit old so I need to replace it I'm trying to use this little webcam um, I'm just going to 
plug it in somewhere different. Hope that works. Okay, worst case scenario, I'm just gonna use my other <clears throat> webcam. I was gonna do kind of both, but I'll, <clears throat> let me try one more thing and then if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll go with it. Okay. Well, sorry for the delay. This was working great a few minutes before the lecture, and then I had to add my touchpad device, which I think was overloading my computer's USB ports. All right. So what I wanted to do is show you a little bit of chemistry here. We've got a pH test kit, a little test tube to do the chemistry in, and a little card reader that's showing us the, um, the pH of our solution. Um, let's do this, how about that? The pH of our solution given the color it comes out to, to show. See if I can adjust the uh, focus for you a little bit. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little sample of water from my aquarium. And this is just about five milliliters or so, enough to do the... Um, let the reaction occur. So the, the way this works is I'm gonna add this uh, pH test solution to my little vial of water and it tells me to add three drops and then when I do that, it's gonna change color based on the pH. Now this is actually, like I've mentioned, the, the pH, we have a reversible action uh, reaction. So if I add acid or base, which is the um, pH up would be the base, and then the pH down is the acid, we're going to be able to see the color change in real time because this color is going to just depend on the pH of the solution. Right now, I recently just, when I moved to the aquarium, I had to uh, remove most all of the water and carefully move it across the room and fill it back up with city water, dechlorinate it, and that I wanted to adjust the pH because it turns out that it was pretty basic. So I've added a bunch of um, stuff there. So you see here, we have uh, some color forming immediately and we see that. We also see that it's not, not perfectly well mixed. I have a little cap so we can mix it. Um, but we can see that dye sort of uh, changing as we go. So when I mix it, we get a nice blue color. Even though I brought the acidity down just the other day, it's still looking like it's quite basic. So it looks like 7.6 or higher. It's kind of at the, at the limit of my, my test kit range there. Now, and the fish is happy enough, so I think he's doing okay. So I'm gonna add acid. Uh, this should be sulfuric acid. And just even one little drop should change, make a dramatic change here in the color. if I haven't used it all yet. There we go. So probably see immediately that's changing even though I haven't even mixed it very well yet. And by the time I mix it, here we go. Now we see the reaction has, has gone and pushed 
you know, that drop of acid pushed it way into the um, acid range, and this chemical that changes colors with the, uh, with the pH, we have that equilibrium where it's um, being pushed one way or the other just by adding or subtracting that H plus, or adding H plus or adding OH minus. So now I'm gonna put it back up and we'll see it change back to the blue color. I'll try to just add maybe one drop, see if we can get it somewhere near neutral, but I, I'm doubtful. I think it'll probably shift kind of all the way. All right, so added one drop and you can kind of see the, uh, the color changing a bit. Let's see what, what result we get when we mix it. Okay, so it's still, still somewhat acidic. We'll try one more. And it's kind of neat, you can see the, uh, the places that are, that have the most base in solution there are, uh, are turning blue. And so it's, it's actually a good, good example of kind of a tracer or a mixing test. Okay, still too acidic, so we'll do another. This time looks like, yep, turned it bright blue. Okay, uh, well actually, now I'm mixing some more. Looks like that reaction didn't, didn't reach equilibrium as fast as I thought it would. Or maybe some of the, uh, some of the acid got stuck on the walls and then once I, once I mixed it, it got better mixed. So now we see here we are somewhere more neutral pH. And then I could, uh, I could add more base and we'll get um, bluer and bluer as we go. So that's a, a reversible reaction. We're watching in real time this color. I'm just gonna make it very blue. We're watching this color transform based on the chemical species that's there. This time I think it'll probably stay blue because I added quite a bit of base. Okay, so let me know, did you guys, did you guys like this? Was this kind of interesting? Did it work? Did you lose, did I lose you? What's going on? Cool. And again, I, sorry about the webcam issue. I have a second webcam. I was all excited and going to use it, but, um, awesome. Glad, glad to hear that. I'm going to move this back. Well, that's most of what I wanted to, to share today. I was gonna do a quick overview of uh, drinking water, how it works and um, how we regulate it, things like that. That'll just take a, a few minutes at the beginning of next class. Um, wanted to have some fun with the, uh, the chemistry here. So great, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, this chemistry that, um, that's a good question, I'll answer that. Um, this, this kind of chemistry should be about uh, about it in terms of what we're going to need and we're going to come back to it a little bit um, as needed. Okay, so with that, that's about all I have. Otherwise, I'm going to show you the fish. Uh, maybe sometime I'll get a, a USB adapter extender um, thing and then I can give you a, a fish cam while I... something more interesting to look at um, in the future. But Feel free to sign off, that's, that's all I've got for you. Then I'm gonna to try to show you the fish a little closer for those of you who are interested. It's actually quite, quite a nicely colored fish. I caught in the, <laughs> yes. Um, I caught it in the co Let me see if I can, um, I'm just gonna turn this off for just a moment, the um, camera. That way I'm, I can, not make you super dizzy as I turn the lights off and stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll work on getting the fish cam set up for uh, optimal entertainment in the future.
There's the fish. Let's see if I can uh, There you go. You can kind of see them. All right, and I'll, I'll go ahead and feed them for you. And then we can maybe see, see them move around a bit. Oh yeah, I never answered what kind of fish, sorry. Um, this is a, I think it's a long ear sunfish. Um, that's my best guess and I'll, uh, I'll pull up a, a web page on that in just a moment. Hopefully he'll go and uh, and move around. Um, it's, just kind of skittish, I think. It, it um, probably will eat in a moment. Let's see if I can... Uh... So, I think... I think it's one of these uh, long ear sunfish species. You can kind of see the other camera. Yeah, he's being pretty shy. It's probably because um, I've been messing around next to the aquarium so much. just because we're having fun here, I'll uh, leave this on for a couple minutes while I start um, uploading this. Yeah, it's a camera shy one. It might, it might not like that I'm talking. I don't know. It, it also doesn't help that I just moved it a, a couple days ago and oh, it looks like maybe he's, he's going now. The, uh, the process of moving, removing all that water, adding all of bunch of new new water in was a bit traumatic but there you go now it's gonna go eat need to rearrange the uh, the thing inside there to make it um, make it more visible All right. I'll let you guys watch that while I upload the um, the lecture slides There you go. Now he's eating. It is a very shy fish. I think maybe because I was talking so loud. There it goes. I'll put a little fish trap out in the creek nearby. I'll, I'll put some smaller fish in there for more entertainment. 
when I get around to it. Um, I had a I had a bunch of smaller fish in there for a little while, and then they started eating the plant um, plants. But I think it did help help this one be less shy. So we'll try that again at some point. We'll have more fish there for you. I don't think he likes the light. All right, well, I think that's that's about it for today. Um, hope you guys have a good weekend. And I'll talk to you guys uh, next time. Bye for now.